It's time for Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Brussel, who for three years has shared with us her decades research into political assassinations and abuses of power in this country. Her program relates the news of the week to emerging evidence about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains by force its control over the legislative and judicial processes in America. And now, here's May. Good afternoon. This is May Brussel in Carmel, California. Dialogue Conspiracy number 204, July the 7th, 1975. Uh, you heard on the news, the Carmel people heard news of the CBS report, the news correspondent, and Daniel Shore. I'll repeat it for those who get this broadcast taped in other cities, get it a week later. You may have heard or not heard it this week that the CBS news correspondent, Daniel Shore, reports he located a former CIA official who claims to have read a CIA memo about Lee Harvey Oswald. The memo was allegedly written in 1962, a year before the assassination of President Kennedy. Shore interviewed the former agency employee on CBS Evening News. This was this last week, but withheld his name and picture at the official's request. The former CIA official stated that he came across a memo in 1962 which consisted of an interview report, report from a redefector from the Soviet Union. The redefector who was interviewed matched Oswald's description almost perfectly. According to the CIA official, the redefector was described as an ex-Marine who had defected to Russia, worked in a radio factory in Minsk, and then redefected with his family to the United States in 1962. This is an exact account of Oswald's defection history. The official told CBS that CIA memo dealt mainly with intelligence on the Minsk radio plant. CIA Director John McCone testified following Kennedy's death that the agency never had any contact with Lee Harvey Oswald. The CIA, in response to questions from CBS, admitted that such a memo exists, but the agency said that an interview was not with Oswald but with a former Navy officer who defected at the same time. Dialogue Conspiracy today is going to bring you, first on KLRB, a very explosive document which I have in my files. I've had it five years from the National Archives. It may not even exist in its original form, but it can be verified as coming from the National Archives and from the working collection of Mr. Liebler of the Warren Commission, having to do with Oswald's work in the radio factory in Minsk. This is terribly important, and I want to go slowly with you and give you the documentation that then I will send to CBS in Washington, D.C., because the radio factory and the contacts that Oswald had were very essential, not only to his CIA work in the Soviet Union, but I think they were instrumental in helping bring down the U-2 flight of Gary Powers. That's why Oswald was in the Soviet Union. I'm convinced of that. His wife was a CIA agent, and I, I have the documentation and proof, and we'll go into that in a few minutes. Before I go further into Dialogue Conspiracy today, I do want to welcome a new station that will begin listening starting this week. Last week, we uh, entered KCBX from San Luis Obispo here in California. I hope they like the first show. I have to explain that we are a continuing series. It is a course in a way of analyzing the news and going into these documents that I have. I hope the pace wasn't too fast. And this week, uh, WYSO-FM in Yellow Springs, Ohio, is going to begin the series of Dialogue Conspiracy. That's on the campus at Antioch College in Ohio. I was back in Ohio at Dayton University, uh, Wright University, rather, in Dayton, this last year to speak to the campus and also at Dayton University the year before. I have a lot of good friends in Ohio that have listened to Dialogue Conspiracy before back there, and I'm really excited that Yellow Springs is going to carry this weekly show. I did a radio interview there with them in Ohio just this last May. We'll try to go slow, and I will proceed with this radio factory in just a moment. I do want to say that uh, those of you who listen and are leaving town, going to school in the fall, ask your college stations to join what I call this caravan of truth, along with these other stations, and you can get cassettes of these radio broadcasts. They're 
$2.60 for each 45-minute show, or you can order a series of four 45-minute four reels and um, play on the station, FM stations, introduce new stations to dialogue conspiracy. It is my contention, of course, each week, uh, as I explain to the new people that listen, the new stations that begin to tune in, Dialogue Conspiracy is a weekly news program that just discusses political assassinations and conspiracies re involving assassinations in the United States that are interlocking. And I take the news of the week and show how it pertains back to my 11 years of research into the assassinations of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, the shooting of George Wallace, the killing of Mary Jo Kopechny, and of course it is my belief that literally hundreds and hundreds of murders have taken place in the last 11 years, and they are all linked to the identical persons, the identical government agencies, and the political assassinations of candidates or presidents or people associated with candidates is not limited to election years, but it takes place continuously, just like the murder of Sam Giacano two weeks ago, who was supposed to be a witness before the Senate Committee on the Links of the Mafia to the CIA. Um, Giancano was murdered. Robert May, who was given immunity. Mr. Rosselli was brought in for a few light questions. And then a man named Mr. Shelfield Edwards, who was head of the CIA's Office of Security that called this, set this all up. He isn't called, but Mr. Giancano was murdered. Well, along those lines, and before I get back to that radio factory in Minsk, I have to mention an article that came over the Associated Press today, and maybe some of you have seen it, and maybe you haven't. The title is, A Report for U.S. School for Assassins. It came from the London Times. It's from a U.S. Navy psychologist, Lieutenant Commander Thomas Nehrut, who works at a Navy hospital in psychological behavior modification in Naples. And he gave a speech at Oslo last week at the NATO conference for 120 psychological researchers and said that the Navy has a school for assassins and that they keep men that they've taken for their combat readiness. They've either been, uh, they've murdered somebody and they're in stockades and they already can be used as hit men or assassins or they've taken them from submarine work or flight training where they're used to dangerous occupations and combat readiness units they're called and he said that they are trained both in Naples, and now this is important, and also at the Navy's Neuropsychiatric Laboratory in San Diego. Now, San Diego is an important location of part of the founding of the SLA by the CIA, and he claims there's a hospital run by the Navy in San Diego, a neuropsychiatric hospital, and that they take these trainees and sometimes bolt their heads in a clamp in order to force them to watch movies so that they get rid of their qualms about killing. And they condition them and teach them and send them to embassies. And he said our embassies around the world have these killers employed where they can get rid of somebody if they want. He said they're stationed and trained and placed in the American embassies around the world. Does that remind you of King Faisal's nephew who got into the palace and very easily got in? He was in California, allegedly had acid, went to Berkeley recently had his head cut off. Um, we have people placed in embassies, and the murder of King Faisal, of course, changes the picture of oil and espionage in the Persian Gulf, and it lands in the hands of the Shah of Iran, and that's why Richard Helms is over there at the present time. Um, the School for Assassins, I don't know what date it was set up, but in my Realist article, the Senate Select Committee's part of the cover-up, that's an article I wrote in 1973. I wrote about a school for assassins that was run by the FBI and CIA for 20 years that was down in Mexico, in Oaxaca, Mexico. And those of you that have heard Dialogue Conspiracy are familiar with this location. It's the murder incorporated that LBJ was talking about three months before he was killed. This is a so-called church. It isn't a church. They're the best trained marksmen to be sent all over the world. The exposure of the church, its location, its funding, was put in a document by a lawyer in the Southwest in 1970. So I imagine they changed their area and um, now have located, for example, down in San Diego where this man says that he is a part of the Navy psychological behavior modification. So the FBI and the CIA funding of this particular missionary down in Mexico could very easily be checked out 
by the Senate Select Committees if they wanted, the ones investigating intelligence, and this U.S. School for Assassins, not only in Naples, but in, in San Diego, was in Mexico and is linked to the John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King assassinations. Well, Daniel Shore uh, talked this last week on CBS about this gentleman who saw the memo about the, the defector in the Soviet Union. I talked with persons from CBS just, uh, it was last May, and they're making a movie about Lee Harvey Oswald, and I explained to them, you're talking to the wrong people, you're asking the right people the wrong questions, because they had interviewed John McVicker from the Soviet Union for the American Embassy, and Richard Snyder, and also Priscilla Johnson, and I said, these three people are from the Central Intelligence Agency, and McVicker was responsible for Marina Oswald's departure of the United States, and Snyder was in charge of Oswald's departure, and his papers in the CIA, and Priscilla Johnson worked with Oswald in the Soviet Union, and there were many others, too. The response from CBS at the time was that, uh, well, you can't believe books, a book who's who in the CIA listed these people. I'd already done my research on this information before I ever received that book, and they said, well, you can't trust a book that's printed in East Germany. And my response was, just because it comes from East Germany doesn't necessarily mean that it was wrong. I explained to them that Oswald was in contact with the CIA, and one of the big clues to the Oswald conspiracy, of his role in the conspiracy of killing John Kennedy with the CIA, was a Mr. Alexander Ziger, Z-I-G-E-R, who managed a radio factory in Minsk where Lee Harvey Oswald worked. Now, some of you might have seen the movie A Death of File. There was a gentleman in that movie named Simon Weisenthal, Weisenthal, rather. He exists in West Germany. He has spent the bulk of the last 20 years, 25 years, trying to find Nazi war criminals around the world. And many war criminals left this country, went to Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, and they changed their names and took... Jewish names and came back to Europe or working around the world, they're former Nazis. And I have a correspondence in my files with Mr. Weisenthal, and I told him, uh, this was about four or five years ago, check out Alexander Zeiger. I believe that he's a Nazi who fled Europe after Hitler lost the war and went down to Argentine. And he came back to Russia, and he's running a radio factory in Minsk where Lee Harvey Oswald worked. And at the time, uh, Weisenthal wrote back to me. He couldn't trace Alexander Zeiger, and we let the matter drop. We couldn't go any further. Well, I have a document in front of me now from the uh, possession of Mr. Wesley Liebler. He was a member of the Warren Commission, and it belongs as minutes of a meeting between Mr. Slauson, that's another member of the Warren Commission, Mr. Slauson, who is a constituent and a friend of Gerald Ford, they were close to Gerald Ford, and Mr. Slauson was the same gentleman who said that he fudged parts of the Warren Report and put in phantom exhibits on the permission of the FBI. He lied about Oswald's role in Mexico City, and this is where that school of assassins were. This is a meeting that I have a record of it, of De Mr. Slauson and Don Levine, I'll give you the background of Don Levine and Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles was the man fired by John Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs invasion. He was the former head of the CIA. He worked in Switzerland with General Reinhard Galen, chief of Hitler's intelligence, and he combined Galen's agents in the Soviet Union, Nazi agents, hiding as Soviet citizens. And uh, Alan Dulles's agents in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Galen's agents, were those that were friendly of Lee and Marina Oswald in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The third person in this meeting was Don Levine. And the memo that I'm going to read to you has to do with the radio factory in Minsk, the very radio factory that this person surfaced this week and talked about the defector that worked with intelligence at the Minsk radio factory. The Isaac Don Levine that was participating in this memo was writing up his relationships with Marina Oswald. As soon as Lee Harvey Oswald was murdered in Dallas, Texas, uh, De Levine got a, a role, which he's played ever since the Cold War, of perpetuating untruths to keep the communist uh, conspiracy story going. And his assignment after the killing of John Kennedy was to take on uh, Marina Oswald 
and, in quotes, help her write a book, which would be a fabrication, but it was also a CIA way of paying her off $25,000 as soon as uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was gone. In my article on in The Realist, written July 73, the one on the Senate Select Committee's part of the cover-up, uh, oh, no, this is, pardon me, this is for my first Realist article, on Watergate, linking Watergate to the John Kennedy assassination to Richard Nixon's power. I have a description of Isaac Don Levine, and I'll read it to you because then I'm going to read you what Levine is saying about the radio factory in Minsk. Isaac Don Levine is the man who took Whitaker Chambers by the arm, a reluctant Chambers who was ready to back down about testifying about Alger Hiss. And Isaac Don Levine worked very closely with Richard Nixon, and he arranged the meeting where he would begin to smear Alger Hiss. It was no coincidence that the same Isaac Don Levine would be meeting with Marina Oswald, the widow of Lee Harvey Oswald, immediately following the murder of President Kennedy. They were in a huddle to exchange money for squeezing a communist story out of a CIA plot. I wrote this in 1972. Levine served Richard Nixon's career faithfully and many times all through the years. Now, at the minutes of the Warren Commission meeting, John J. McCloy, who was the lawyer for the Rockefeller family and Chase Manhattan Bank, said this is a January 21st meeting, 1964. He told the members of the Warren Commission, this fellow Levine is in contact with Marina to break the story up in a little more graphic manner and tie it into a Russian business. And it is with the thought and background of a Russian conspiracy connection concept that Isaac Don Levine was brought to Texas to meet with Marina Oswald. Now, Levine uh, sent a memo and, uh, to the Warren Commission, and he offered to be a witness before them, but the affidavit was good enough, and Levine had a meeting, as I say, with Alan Dulles and Mr. Slauson, and the meeting was recorded and sent to the files of Mr. Wesley Liebler, and what I'm reading you is from his files. And this is dated June the 2nd, 1964. And it's sent from Debbie David Slauson, who participated in that meeting, to Mr. J. Lee Rankin and Howard Willens, Norman Redlick, and Wesley Liebler. Those men, four men, are attorneys for the Warren Commission, and J. Lee Rankin was the main general counsel for the Warren Commission. And W. David Slauson was part of a meeting, as I say, with Levine and Dulles. And the subject was the conference that Slauson had with Levine and Dulles, the former head of the CIA. Now, Levine allegedly was an expert on Russian politics, and the subjects that he was supposed to do were to bring in the clandestine part of Lee Harvey Oswald as being a uh, Russian spy, but the meeting was between Alan Dulles of the CIA and Levine, who was working with the CIA in the Cold War. At the end of the transcript that Levine had, and I have here, it's about a 30-page um, typed up resume of the meeting of these people, Levine said that when Lee Harvey Oswald left the Soviet Union, he filed, he smuggled out a message to one of the relatives of the Zigers, who was living in the United States. Now, Alexander Zeiger was the head of the Minsk radio factory where Lee Harvey Oswald worked. This Zeiger was out very important to the Kennedy assassination because of the links of Oswald to the CIA. And this transcript says that Oswald left Russia, and he took with him a message from the relatives of Zeiger, the man who ran the radio factory in Minsk, where Oswald was. And the message asked for help. The Zigers had two daughters that Lee and Marina Oswald were friendly with, and the daughters wanted to leave the Soviet Union, like Marina wanted to leave the Soviet Union. She was a white Russian of aristocratic family, and she didn't like living under communism. The Zeiger daughters were born in Argentina. After World War II, Zeiger fled to Argentina. He stayed there, came back, and managed this radio factory in Minsk. But in the interim, he had two daughters who did not like living in the Soviet Union, and he, those, he asked that these daughters be taken out of Russia, like Marina, and back to Argentina, and the Argentine government could take an interest in the matter. Now, the letter was smuggled out by Lee and Marina Oswald, but what the letter was said was that the American government, such as the CIA, should set up 
the contacts and machinery in motion. Now, if Lee Harvey Oswald was a communist, a defector, he wouldn't be carrying out a letter that Alan Dulles is going to act upon supporting the fact that the CIA should help bring the daughters of the man who worked at the radio factory with Lee Harvey Oswald out of the Soviet Union. Alan Dulles never said in the conversation or memo, what do we want these girls for, or are they communists? Is Oswald a communist? Here's Oswald coming back to the United States, Marina's coming back to the United States, and two girls are supposed to be coming out that were friends of theirs. No, Alan Dulles said there's no reason not to bring this to the attention of the CIA. He no longer was in the CIA because Kennedy had kicked him out, but he was now on the Warren Commission. He said there's no reason not to bring this to the attention of the CIA. The letter goes on to say that the girls had relatives in the United States who had paid their way out. Now, Zeiger, as I said, was head of the radio factory in the Mints where Oswald worked. I suspected these two of sabotaging the peace talks and bringing uh, the U-2 down, and Alan Dulles was going to help. It's confirmed in these letters and the memos that I have here that mean that Alan Dulles agreed to help to bring Mr. Zeiger's daughters out through the CIA down to Argentina, which shows that the CIA had to be working with Oswald in the Soviet Union and assisting in bringing these particular people out of the Soviet Union. Oswald's work at the radio factory was terribly important. I can read you some documentation from the Warren Commission hearings. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this broadcast, uh, when I go into this kind of research, there's various sources of material that I use. One is the Warren Report. One is the 26 volumes of the Warren Commission hearings of testimony and exhibits. Another is archived documents that have come from Washington, D.C. And then there are books and um, magazine or newspaper articles of new material coming out. In the Warren Commission hearings, page uh, 266 to 288, volume 8, there's a testimony of Daniel Patrick Powers, who's now a teacher in Wisconsin, who was in 64. He served in the Marines with Oswald. He went to, uh, from Florida to Biloxi, Mississippi, as part of radar training. They had special training at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. He, he said Oswald was a good student. He uh, was seventh in a class of 30. Powers completed a Bachelor of Science and a Master's degree in 1964. He and Oswald were stationed at Itsugi Air Force Base, the home of the U-2 flights, the spy missions. Oswald was playing chess, reading good literature, studying Russian. He was assigned to the Marine Air Control Squadron Number 1 at the Naval Air Station at Itsugi. They were radar operators. The squadron composed a radar group. The function was to support landings with control of aircraft areas or target sites. Now, this is in Volume 8, page 266, the testimony of Daniel Powers Oswald trained in landings with radar groups. The function was to support the landings with the control of aircraft areas. They would control the aircraft by radar rather than use it with visual flight. Remember, the U-2s were not seen visually. That was the selling point. He said they were sent to Subi Point and Subic Bay in the Philippines. Oswald's autobiographical material that was prepared refers to the fact that he was at Subic Base, and it was confirmed by Daniel Powers, and Mr. Jenner of the Warren Commission admitted on page 280 of Volume 8 that it was not in his official Marine record. They kept it out, but that he was there. And in this particular assignment, this is in Volume 8, Mr. Powers said we were plotting Simulated aircraft, we were scanning it. We had temporary duty at Subi. They were closely guarding the hangar. It developed that there was a U-2 aircraft in it at the hangar. Oswald was part of that group. We were plotting simulated aircraft. Oswald never expressed sympathy towards the Communist Party or the Marxists. That's Mr. Powers. Then John Donovan was another witness before the Warren Commission, and I have some documents of his, some private uh, these are from the National Archives on John Emmett Donovan, former commanding officer of Lee Harvey Oswald in the Marines from March 59 to September 59, that Oswald served as a radar plotter for the U.S. Marine Air Control. Donovan was an instructor at an academy in Alexander, Virginia at the time. He was called as a witness before the Warren Commission. He was the officer over Oswald. He said both were attached to counter-air operations, Marine Air Control Squadron in Santa Ana. 
Oswald was one of a minority who actually knew what was happening in world affairs, particularly in politics. He used his superior knowledge of world political situations to trip the unwary officers. He was dependable on watch during performance of duties with the crew, such as radar scanning operations. He believed Oswald's classification would be an operations man. Oswald had a high IQ. His position with the radar crew gave him access to all secret radio frequencies, call signs, authentication codes utilized in connection with the normal function of the Marine Air Control Squadron. Oswald also knew the displacement of most military squadrons of all services on the West Coast and the number and type of aircraft in all services ranging the, the locations of the radar control site on the West Coast. His position required a secret clearance and access to the locations the operator was gained by presentation of appropriate credentials to the guard on duty. That is Lee Harvey Oswald's radar work, and I have some more information. This is from the United States Secret Service Treasury Department. Uh, some more on Donovan talking about Oswald as a plotter for the Air Control Squadron. He pointed out that the U.S. Marine Corps selects men for combat air operations stations of superior intelligence above average score on general classification tests. In addition, prospective candidates are screened to ensure good, hard-eyed coordination and reflex action. In comparison with the average enlisted man, Oswald was of higher intellect and intelligence during his tour of duty under Donovan's command performance. He worked well. As a plotter for Air Control Squadron No. 9, it was Oswald, Oswald's duty to position himself by a radar screen maintaining air surveillance on the area. If any aircraft from other than friendly nations was detected, it was his job to immediately furnish the senior watch officer with the course and speed and altitude and make immediately precise adjustments. He was dependable, very cool, deliberate under tensions. He recalled that Oswald was at, at one occasion identified an emergency in a matter-of-fact voice. He did not get excited. He did the right thing at the right time. His associates in Squadron 9 were generally men of higher intellect and intelligence. Being college-educated, Oswald was a voracious reader, read books in a serious vein at college-level textbooks. He would pride himself on knowing the name of great philosophers and would mention their names. Now that is from persons that trained Oswald in the radar work or worked with him in the radar operations. Now, let us go to what Marguerite Oswald said about her son before the Warren Commission, and then I'll conclude with Gerald Ford said in his book, because I do like to each week talk about a good book called The Portrait of the Assassin by the President of the United States, and see if you can reconcile what Gerald Ford is saying with these kinds of documentations, that the CIA is willing to bring home the two daughters of the Oswald's friend in the Soviet Union and send them back down to Argentine. Their sympathies are obviously not with Marxism or with the Soviet Union. And reconcile with what his, the officers, Powers and Donovan can say and the kind of documentation Oswald had. When Marguerite Oswald, the mother of Lee Harvey Oswald, was called before the Warren Commission, her testimony was taken. And I'm going to read you some quotations that she gave because they were in Gerald Ford's book. I could take them from Volume 1 of the Warren Commission hearings. But I want to go to what Gerald Ford put in his own book because in Chapter 4, he has a, a chapter called Marguerite's Viewpoint. The book, again, I say, is the one that Gerald Ford, the President of the United States, wrote when he was a member of the Warren Commission. Chapter 5 is called Another Side of Lee Harvey Oswald. And after Gerald Ford gets going in his book, he relies on that fictitious diary, but he does give Marine Marguerite Oswald, the mother of Oswald, a few chances to say what she wanted to say and keep this in mind with the new person surfacing who is on CBS who knows that Oswald was an agent of the CIA. Uh, this man has surfaced now and said he's seen the memos. This is what Marguerite Oswald said in 1964 before the Warren Commission and this was in the book of Gerald Ford's uh, book, The Portrait of the Assassin. She said January 21st, 1961, she was certain that her son was an agent of the American government. She made a trip to Washington, D.C. to see if her son would come back from the Soviet Union. She borrowed money on an insurance policy, and she called the White House from the train station at 8 a.m. to speak to the president, and President Kennedy was in conference. That's one conference that President John Kennedy should never have missed because that's the one that probably would have saved his life 
from this elaborate conspiracy. Dean Rusk's secretary got on the line, and a Mr. Boster from the Soviet Affairs talked with her. He said, I'm familiar with the case. Will 11 o'clock appointment be okay? And they told her what hotel to stay at, and Marguerite Oswald was in the State Department within three hours saying, my son is an agent of the United States government. He's needed at home. You've exploited him by saying he's a defector. Three months later, eight weeks uh, later, March 22, 1961, Lee Harvey Oswald sent a letter saying that he wished to return to the United States. On April the 30th, 1961, he married a Russian girl approximately five weeks later. Lee claimed on March 21st he wanted to come back to the United States. This followed eight weeks after his mother was in Washington. But this CIA agent, and I call her a CIA agent, Marina Oswald, who I say is not a wife, who is an espionage agent, became engaged and married Oswald within five weeks. Uh, Marguerite Oswald said, and this is in Gerald Ford's book, that the embassy ordered him to marry this Russian girl. A few weeks later, he's, he's ready to come home with this girl. He doesn't get out of the Soviet Union with a Russian girl with money loaned to him by the U.S. Embassy unless the embassy ordered him to marry this Russian girl. He's, Marguerite said, I asked Lee, why did you come back to the United States if you had a job and you're married to a Russian girl? And he answered, even Marina doesn't know that. At the Payne's home in, da in Irving, Texas, near Dallas, Marguerite Oswald claimed there was this literature from the Daily Worker on communism and Marxism, and she says, I don't think Lee would leave that around and fit if he was going to assassinate the president, and he believed these things, he wouldn't leave it around. She says, I believe Marina loved him in a way, but I believe Marina wanted to come to America. I know a little about the CIA. This is Marguerite Oswald. The U-2 powers and the things made public, they go to any extreme for their country, and I don't think that would be serious for him to marry a Russian girl and bring her here so he could have contact. It's all part of the agent's duty. I think my son is an agent. I'm not the only one who thinks my son is an agent. Mr. Rankin of the Warren Commission asked her question. How much money do you think he received for being an agent? And Marguerite said, I don't know, but I have approximately $900 and Marina has $35,000 that she's announced publicly. This was in January 1964, right after the Kennedy assassination. And she said, where does the money come from? Mr. Rankin, chief counsel of the Warren Commission, said, you don't have any proof of a conspiracy. And Marguerite Oswald, the mother of Lee Harvey Oswald, said, I feel like the Dallas police do not have proof that my son, son shot President Kennedy. If they have anything, it is only circumstantial evidence. And I have as much circumstantial evidence here that Lee was an agent as the Dallas police have that he shot President Kennedy. Now that's from Gerald Ford's book, Portrait of the Assassin, The Mother's Viewpoint. This is Marguerite's viewpoint, Marguerite's viewpoint, Gerald Ford, Chapter 4. Now what did Gerald Ford say? He was the best friend the CIA had on the Warren Commission. That's a quotation from Jim Garrison from New Orleans, whose research is being proven to be correct about Clay Shaw and David Ferry. What did Gerald Ford start the next chapter with? Chapter 5, Portrait of Assassin, another side of Lee Harvey Oswald. This is the way it begins. With a mother's natural loyalty and pride in her son, Marguerite refused to accept the picture of Lee as a psychotic killer. With an instinct to protect not only her son's image, but indirectly her own, she tenaciously clung to the belief that there was nothing abnormal about the boy. Her testimony before the commission raised questions that rightfully had to be answered, and never were. But the other side of Oswald, the side she never knew, little or nothing about, does not convey the picture of a normal 20-year-old boy, 20-year-old. Now, this is the story that Gerald Ford wrote in his book, that a mother's loyalty and pride was hiding a psychotic killer. Mind you, a killer who had a weapon with no fingerprints, no paraffin test, nobody ever saw him with his weapon, and that she protect him in her own image and clung tenaciously. But she said the other Oswald had nothing to do, it does not convey the picture. She says Oswald uh, was not a normal 20-year-old. Now, that is Gerald Ford saying Oswald was not normal. 
The only thing that was abnormal about the Kennedy assassination was the manipulation of the facts and evidence. Oswald was a perfectly normal 20-year-old. I read you just two examples of officers in the Navy. The Marine records, which is the toughest branch of the service of the United States, shows three years of being a perfectly normal, perfectly responsible person with intelligence, ability to act fast. The only things about abnormal about Oswald in this interim for Marines until the time he was killed was his relationship to the United States government. He asked for his passport back in the Soviet Union. It was sent to him. He asked for money to come back from the United States. It was sent to him immediately. He got his passport before he left the Marines, and it said he was going to the Soviet Union, and he had top security clearance in the Marines. An Army airplane met him at Helsinki. It was not an ordinary commercial airline, and from there he went from Helsinki to Moscow. The money to bring his Russian wife back came from the State Department, and it was paid in large sums, which isn't explained by the way Oswald worked when he came home from the Soviet Union. When he arrived at the harbor in New York, he was escorted by one of the top chiefs of the Anti-Communist League at the harbor in New York, taken to the hotel, and then taken to the airport, where he proceeded to Fort Worth in Dallas in 1962. The very first person Oswald contacted when he came home from the Soviet Union was Max Clark, chief of security, the FBI man working at Convair General Dynamics in Fort Worth, Texas. In 1963, he went to the New Orleans offices for a passport and said he wanted to return to the Soviet Union. And after having been a defector and allegedly there would be a card or a hold on his passport, Within 24 hours, he was back at the office and had a passport to return to the Soviet Union. He was in contact with FBI agents in Dallas, in Fort Worth, in New Orleans, when he was arrested on an altercation and put in the jail in New Orleans overnight. He sat with the police chief and asked for the FBI man. The FBI man came to the jail. Oswald was released. He sat on a bus going to Mexico, where the School for Assassins was, run by a man named Albert Osborne, alias John Howard Bowen, and another man was sat from the CIA he sat on the bus also with Oswald going down to Mexico City in uh, the fall of 1963. None of these things are normal, and the Warren Commission has evidence which they printed in their 26 volumes that I read on the air and quote to you about Lee Harvey Oswald, and yet Gerald Ford, President of the United States, clings to the story that Oswald was a psychotic killer and that there was nothing normal about this particular person. And yet Gerald Ford based his book on his idea of the true Lee Harvey Oswald, what he called the historic diary, which did on the radio show a few weeks ago I talked about it. He will not tell where the diary came from. We haven't seen the original. There's no proof that Lee Harvey Oswald wrote that diary. I doubt if it exists or fingerprints on it. There's no evidence of where Marina Oswald saw the diary the first time, how the officials got it, how Life magazine got it, and or whether E. Howard Hunt wrote that diary for Alan Dulles. And Gerald Ford, I believe, should be impeached like Richard Nixon for continuing this story of covering up the real Lee Harvey Oswald. I spoke with uh, CBS this week and sent them a copy of the document, uh, the one half that was in, used in Gerald Ford's book about Lee Harvey Oswald, the rumor that Lee Harvey Oswald was an agent of the FBI. But I sent them the other half of the document that Mr. Melvin Belli, the attorney for Jack Ruby, was familiar with the allegations, as was Henry Wade, the district attorney of Dallas, that Oswald carried the number 110669 of the CIA and that he was an agent of the CIA. I think the true story of the Radio Factory, the news breaking this week, is very important, and I will be in touch with the CBS people again about this, because the memo, admittedly by the CIA, does exist, and the American people should know that Alan Dulles of the CIA was making arrangements, or did make them, to bring over the daughters of Mr. Zeiger, who worked with Oswald in that Radio Factory. And furthermore, those daughters were, one of them was working with an anti-Castro Cuban, and that part is left out of the document which I have here, which is very interesting. Uh, I have certain pages, and certain pages are deleted. I brought into the studio, it has to do with Marina Oswald. Alan Dulles is talking to Mr. Levine, and they're talking about her marriage, and Levine said, at the drop of the hat, the way they live is beyond comprehension. She married him within six weeks, 
but I think that was inducement. He had the apartment with before their marriage. It simply points one more item to speak. That's page 10. Now, page 11, 12, and 13 are missing from this very important document that I have. But then Isaac Don Levine on page 14 says, I'm sure you have it in your papers because I have both a Spanish and English translation in my papers of his report. This was a man sent by the anti-Castro people in New Orleans and worked with Marina Oswald. And Marina was there and the baby was there. And it has to do with anti-Castro people and a daughter of a... Um, Zeiger, Mr. Zeiger, was going with a member of the anti-Castro community who was placed in the Soviet Union. And also there was an agent of the CIA who came to New Orleans who was working, a friend of Lee Harvey Oswald's. He worked as a spy in Russia, along with Lee Harvey Oswald, and both of them were in New Orleans. Lee and Marina Oswald smuggled out of the Soviet Union the letter from the Zeiger girls and got it to the CIA, and Alan Dulles was to proceed and take care that these girls would be taken out of the Soviet Union, that Argentina would request them being Argentine citizens. Levine says in this document on page 14, I think I've covered the rest. I told you about the Argentine family, the two girls. Marina and Lee Oswald smuggled out a letter or a manuscript for the Argentine family with them when they came. Now, this wasn't just any Argentine family. This was the man who ran the radio factory in Minsk with Lee Harvey Oswald. And it said that these girls wanted to come out. Levine said if, if Mr. Dulles, not Khrushchev, Khrushchev couldn't do it, but if Mr. Dulles could get the ambassador from Argentine that there is money and means for these girls, that somebody in America would pay their transportation, if our Central Intelligence Agency would arrange it, that the transportation would be sent and those girls could leave the Soviet Union. And it went on that, that Marina Oswald wanted, it goes on to say that Oswald attitude her attitude was that she was a petty bourgeois she wanted an american home her friends lived in a forty-five thousand dollar suburb home her idea of heaven levine said a modern equipment radio tv dishwasher silk stockings everything in the world dresses galore and she already has a lot i have another part of this document where they threatened to deport marina oswald if she didn't go along with the story and it said um, that she was threatened by the FBI and the State Department, and uh, she wouldn't tell everything she knew, but if she told too much of what she knew, she would be deported. So she had to go along with the story. And, and the document is quite long. Some pages are left out. But this is a conversation um, that I will be writing up and talking more on the radio. And one more thing, Isaac Don Levine uh, the CIA writer who was working with Marina Oswald, who physically led Whitaker Chambers because he was weak and wanted to back out, w led him to testify against Alger Hiss, the man that catapulted Richard Nixon to fame years ago, brought Richard Nixon to power because of the implications of this Kennedy assassination. Levine had a printer for, Mar for Marina Oswald's book called The Meredith Press, and a Mr. C.V. Jackson and Ed Thompson had a $25,000 proposal for her. Now, I have many people that do private investigative work for me when I give out leads. So let's look in and see if the CIA covered the Meredith Press, a C.V. Jackson and Ed Thompson, because if the CIA is linked to the Meredith Press, then we know they gave Marina Oswald $25,000. Keep in mind, she had this $25,000 from Isaac Don Levine, the man that made Richard Nixon president at one time through his manipulations, and the book never came out, did it? It's 11 years, and it never came out. Is Meredith Press a CIA front? Well, I was on to the radio factory in Minsk five, six, seven years ago while I was doing my work. I am excited this week about the CIA memos of that being a contact of Oswald I was on to Mr. Alexander Zeiger, and if he isn't a Nazi from Germany that fled to Argentina and came back, then he's the only one that isn't, because all of Oswald's contacts were with Nazis from World War II, through Alan Dulles, through Reinhard Galen, and Hitler's intelligence. Well, that's a lot of material for today. I hope uh, Antioch can hold that and our new stations. And take care. We'll see you next week on Dialogue Conspiracy. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Russell, who for 10 years has been researching the facts behind political assassinations and conspiracies in this country. 
Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KELRB-FM in Carmel, California.